What's going on? We're going live again. Bam. We're now live. Okay. So we're having technical difficulties here. Let me, I don't know if it's my side. Uh, it says server is overloaded is what we keep getting. And that must be a be live thing. Let me close out a bunch of crap on my computer here. Um, uh, that wouldn't be the server. Server is overloaded. Try again. No. It's still counting down. So sorry for the technical dif difficulties there, fam. But uh, well, better not better not get out of Chrome. That is what we're using. <laughs> I'm exiting a bunch of different things here. Exiting Chrome would be a disaster. So because that's what we're using. Well, here, I'll, I'll close. All right. Well, hopefully. I'll close out the one other tab I have open and make sure it's not that. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 if you looked at people's computers, I mean you've got people who are organized, and then you've got people like me that I mean uh I was having difficulty going live. I, I joined this this new live streaming program or site, it's called Sessions. It was started by the founder of Pandora, and it's only for music. And I have had a dickens of a time going live and technical issues with their website. It's still fairly new. Yeah. It's invite only. I sent you an application to, to I'm sure you could get on it. There's so many of them, man. It's like there's so many yeah. new live music streaming platforms, and there's that huge void that nobody really understands what Facebook is doing right now. Right. Facebook had a new, for those of you who don't know, Facebook had a, a new terms of service that started October 1st. And now we're into October. What is today? The, the day is the 7th. So it's a weekend and people are yeah. confused because the terms of service were written so vaguely. It said, you cannot create a musical experience. Well, what does that mean? And so it was interpreted being you can't do cover songs because the cover songs interesting thing about the law of uh, it's unique to the United States that when it comes to doing a song that someone else wrote, if you're just releasing a single and it's audio only, there's something called a compulsory license, which the law says that the writers cannot deny you the right to, cover that song right. unless the song is released that there's a one time exception to that. So the compulsory license requires that anyone who wants to cover any song can do so. And then there are, there are standard rates that are paid to the songwriters for, for that song, for the cover, for that song. However, every time it gets played, the songwriters get paid. But when it comes to sync, which is where it's synchronized to video, that's a whole different ball game. That's the wild west. There are no compulsory licenses. So anybody that has a song that they wrote, it's what's case by case before anybody can put it to use it in a video. So it's radically different terrain, right? Yeah. So, the laws change when you bring in the visual aspect of it. Exactly. So Facebook, uh, try, you know, when you're doing a cover of a song, that's obviously has a video. I mean, you know this video, uh, you know this, Jimmy. I mean, you could be saying what I'm saying, but I, for those who are watching, perhaps you don't know. So if you're doing a cover of a song on a video, which is what it is on Facebook, Facebook Live, cover means you didn't write that song, like a popular song. Uh, and Or it could, doesn't have to be popular. It has nothing to do with the popularity, but it's a song that you didn't write. So, But generally when people talk about cover songs, they're talking about a song that the audience would know, you know. Like you go, you're doing a gig, and do you do Sweet Caroline in your gigs? I have do before. You? I mean, what's the response? Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> and especially the women. The women love that song, right? Right. They they don't know any of the lyrics, but they know. <laughs> they know the ba, ba, ba part. It's funny how certain <laughs> things stick in your mind like that, too, man. You know, there's just certain elements, certain songs that burrow into your brain. Yeah, so when people think of cover songs, they usually think about songs like that, or uh, Sweet Home Alabama, or uh, or uh, 
I mean, Brown Eyed Girl. I mean, so many. I mean, it could be a modern song, too. And uh, But it doesn't have to be a popular song. It's a song that you didn't write. It's a cover song. So, I mean, if I covered one of your songs or you covered one of my songs that we didn't co-write together, even though maybe you never even released it. Well, if you if you did if you didn't release it, you could deny me the right. But if it's already been released on one of your eight albums or seven, you have seven, eight. I think yeah. you have eight albums. Working seven. on eight. And uh, then it's already been released. So when it comes to live, so with Facebook, back to the Facebook thing, it comes back to musicians. Now we can't do gigs, so everybody is saying, well. Let's make money doing lives and getting tips. And that was great at first, right? You did that. How many days consecutively did you go live on Facebook? Almost 100 days, 97 days, 98 days. Every day? Every single I day. I did not realize it was that many days. So what broke your, your, your string? Couldn't you make it to 100, Jimmy? Right. <laughs> well, you know, man, the... The, the reason why I stopped doing it was the first day that I felt like I didn't want to do it. Okay. You know what I mean? The first day was like, no, nah, this feels like a job. And I just stopped. No, you got I mean, you made revenue from that. People sending right. you tips. And stuff. You had a PayPal tip yeah. link below, right? Yeah. And, and especially you, starting off, man, at first it was going really well. That's what I'm we're getting at. So how did it... it a decrease. I mean, the first week you did it versus the last week, what percent did I, you? I think it, I think it tapped everybody out. You know, I think the people that were tipping were so getting so much music and, you know, the ones that really patron artists were trying their best to tip as many people as they could and kind of got tapped out on it a little bit. That's my theory, but I don't know. Well, sure. Your first week, if you think of the, without revealing what that was, what, if, if that was uh, a 10, what, what was the number for the for the last week, relatively speaking? What percent of the first week? Three, probably. Three percent? No, 30 percent. Oh, 30 percent. 30 percent. Okay, 30 percent. So it went down, so it became less, less uh, profitable because everybody started streaming. People can't do lives. People are used to making their living playing live. A lot of musicians and make a, make their revenue and suddenly all the venues are closed down because of covid and so people are going on facebook and then facebook and other platforms twitch now has made it uh, fr friendly to artists and and there seems like every day a new platform is being announced but the big the big the big boy was facebook wouldn't you say i mean everybody knows about right. facebook most everybody has a facebook account although Absolutely. i although you know millennials and Generation Zs are saying, don't ever log into Facebook unless you're checking to see if your grandma's still alive. That's other than that, there's no reason for Facebook for that generation. But still, er, most everybody has a Facebook account, how active they are on the account. So Facebook is still the daddy, the big daddy. And now they've made this new, this new uh, ruling that has made it so confusing for musicians. And can you even do your own songs? If you wrote the song while well, you own the rights, who knows? But they haven't made it clear if you can or not. And what if? And there's a disconnect there too. Even though you wrote the song, like I put my, I, I'm pretty aggressive putting my videos, two videos a week, up on YouTube. I'm supposed to do it Mondays and Fridays is my schedule, but this week I didn't get it up till Wednesday. It's a lot of work put, making a video. My latest video is 26 minutes long, uh, and uh, Taylor Swift reaction, uh, my tears ricochet. Check it out. And uh, it takes a lot of effort to research it and do it and edit it. And so I was two days late. But um, YouTube is a real great uh, platform for, you know, finding uh, new videos. And I sometimes do my own songs on there. And even though I wrote the song, I'll get an email from YouTube saying you have a you have a claim against your song that someone else wrote. It's someone else owns the rights. And it was like that other person is me. But I still get an email from YouTube saying that there's a claim. So there's a disconnect there. And then it, they say, OK, somebody owns this song, but they don't immediately connect that it's the same person doing the video. So even YouTube, who I would say is much more advanced than Facebook on the whole video thing. If YouTube has that difficulty making that connection, Facebook is going to be behind them in the development of that. 
And Facebook threatened in their terms that we can literally cancel your account. And somebody who has thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands right. of followers right. risk of losing your, your Facebook account and having to start all over. It's it's happened before with pages. Yeah. People lost their page, Instagram or Facebook, whatever it is, and have to start all over. Uh, that's happened to, I've heard it said. And for whatever reason, somebody hacks it or... Yeah. So it's risky. Nobody wants to go live on Facebook right now. That's why I've been kind of waiting for it to see how it pans out for other people that are doing it a lot. Now, the groups are doing fine, like quarantine karaoke groups and stuff. I think we should maybe put yeah. put a song on YouTube and sue ourselves for copyright infringement. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that just pops in my head, something kind of unrelated, but suing yourself. Um, I read an article on a guy on one of these, you know, people are posting stuff on maybe Quora or somewhere. A guy said that when he was younger, he and his buddies would sue each other and get on these, these uh, TV court shows, you know, like Judge right. Judy. There's a whole slew of them, right? I mean, Judge Judy started, those shows, man. you know, and um, what are some of the other ones? Some of them, they're salty judges. They're funny. They're really funny. And uh, Joe Brown is it? I can't remember the names, but uh, there's a there's a black woman who does a lot of divorce stuff. She's hilarious. I can't remember her name. Um, Judge Judy, I think, is the is the you know mama of it all. But they would literally sue each other to get on these shows, <laughs> just for the I guess I'm on TV or whatever. Okay, you sue me this time for two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars, whatever it is. And then they give the you know if you're suing if I'm suing you. And I have a judgment that you have to pay me $500. I'll give it right back to you after the show, right? right. I mean, sure, of course. Publicity stunt. So um, your idea of suing each other, hey, you might have something there. It might be a good idea. <laughs> we should sue ourselves for $10 million for copyright infringement on one of our songs. <laughs> might be able to get some, uh, get some traction or some headlines out of it. <laughs> It's all right about it's all about being on the edge, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. all about creating that controversy and getting in the news. Um, yeah, I mean, Kanye West is great at that, and I, I'm very. This is fresh in my mind because I just did the video, my tears, the my reaction video to Taylor Swift's "My Tears Ricochet," and I went into a deep dive into the entire. Most people feel that the song is about, she doesn't explicitly say, and she's very coy saying it's about a failed relationship, but the song is, a, uh, most people believe that it's about the fact that Scooter Braun, who was her label advisor and, you know, really her father figure for 15 years, sold the rights to her masters to, uh, sorry, uh, Scott Borchetta, who had been her father figure for 15 years, sold the rights to, sold her masters to Scott, Scooter Braun. And what's the issue with Scooter Braun is because Scooter Braun is a management team behind Kanye West and all the stuff that Kanye West has done. And he's a master of being controversial. I mean, I didn't even realize this when I researched this. You know, uh, there was the whole thing where the, it all started when she won the VMA and he came on stage and grabbed the microphone and said that Beyonce should have won. Remember that? That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's crazy. Teenager and uh, innocent teenager. I mean, I, I looked up that picture and I put it in my video and I'm like, man, you just want to hug her because she's just all excited because she won and then so confused because she's getting attacked like this. And uh, and then she try, she says in her Americana uh, girl you Netflix uh, special, which if you're at all interested, I would encourage anyone watching this to watch that. If you have Netflix, who doesn't have Netflix today, right? Right. <laughs> anyway, in there, she talks about how she was always wanting to be someone who pleased people and uh, make everybody happy. And you can see that, I feel, there's an audio that's been leaked. Now this is years ago audio that's been leaked of when Kanye called her to uh, to say that, talk about the song he was writing, 
and you can hear her voice like he, he's he's being his self, you know, very, very cocky and very and she's just trying to be this, you know, get along kind of person. And the, the controversy was the two lines in the song where I made that bitch famous and I think Taylor and I will still have sex. He claimed that she approved the song. Well, those two lines were never said to her. And then Kim Kardashian recorded the song and she didn't know that they were recording it. And that was at a front to her. And then, but talk about controversy. So Kanye is diving into this controversy. He made a video, which I hadn't seen because I'm not a Kanye West fan. I'm not a rap fan, but researching the video I did yesterday. And it was, it was amazing because he had these wax figures made. He had a wax figure made of Taylor. When I first saw it yesterday, I thought, man, was that a sex tape of Taylor? But no, it's a wax figure that looks. It's in the video. And she mentions that, that he stripped me naked. Uh, so she has this huge thing of Kanye really, and then pretending he wants to make nice and then driving the knife in deeper. And Scooter Braun was, was all behind that. So the point I was getting at is controversy. Kanye is phenomenal at building up controversy which is why a lot of people don't believe that his conversion to Christianity is anything but a, a ploy. So his most recent album, you know, a Christian album, uh, but controversy. Yeah, days, that, was, man. that was a total ploy. Could be. I mean, if a sincere Christian as, as Christian, I mean, if I, if I had realized how I'd wronged someone like that, I would apologize publicly and say I was wrong uh, to Taylor because there were some major affronts to her. And then the whole thing about when the masters were sold, there was a lot of, there was a pissing match between Borchetta and Braun and even Justin Bieber, who's also managed by Scooter Braun, got into the mix and everything was across the social media. And there's a, he said, she said, and, uh, but the bottom line is Taylor felt like she had been metaphorically raped by these things. And, uh, that's what the song, my tears ricochet are about, but, uh, it's awful for her, man. It is, but I mean, she's on top of the game. She was named artist of the decade by the AMAs artist of the decade. You can, you know, is there any higher mountain, I guess, artist of the two decades or artist of the century? I mean, you, you, she's at the top, you know. Kanye West isn't winning Artist of the Decade. So. No, but he might be the next president. <laughs> it could happen, man. <laughs> it could happen, yeah. I'm not ruling out anything. He's he's something else, that guy. I mean, how much of it is a ploy, and how much of it is his actual? Uh, well, I mean, his actual I'm, mental mental instability. You know, his wife right. came out. And who's worried about him that he's got mental instability. Yeah. And is that all a boy? I mean, the Kardashians mastered being in the front of the news cycle continually. Now they finally stopped with their show, I guess. I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's still running or they announced that it's going to end. And uh, they, they have been in the front and center of news for 15 years, that whole family. They are a master at staying in the news cycles. And so... Right. Anything that Kanye West does and the Kardashians, is it all a ploy? I mean, it's hard to believe. It's hard to know, right? So, right. I mean, being famous just for being famous. <laughs> it's a weird well, thing. Which, which, it is a weird thing. It is a weird thing. Very weird thing. Um, you know, catapulted. She was the first one to get famous because of sex tape, or maybe she wasn't the first one. She was one of the first ones. Didn't uh, Paris Hilton, wasn't that her path also? Yeah, that was her claim to fame. And now she's, but she's she's got a business empire. Paris Hilton has got, I saw an article, I think she's got a billion dollar business. Uh, I can't remember what it is, maybe makeup or, or jewelry or something like clothes, that. Clothes, I think. Is it clothes? Okay. You know, so you, you know, she's succeeding with, with uh, she, she's not a dumb woman. She's a smart business person. Absolutely. And or she has a lot of great advisors around her helping her out. Uh, you know, sometimes it's not about you have to be smart enough to hire people that are better than you. You know, that's part of it, too. And letting delegation. Them, you 
Delegation, yeah. So. Delegation is the key to success. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. Uh, sorry, Eddie Van Halen passed, man. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! That hit me. That hit me like it in the chest. It was like what? I mean, I didn't know that he was that ill. Um. Yeah, it's uh, impactful. Very impactful. Um, He's the first guy I remember hearing play guitar that really blew me away when I was a little kid. Is that yeah. was unlike anything we'd heard. He he yeah he was he was absolutely amazing. Uh, his playing he invented a whole new the whole tapping thing. Well, he 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 admits that he didn't invent it, but he he definitely yeah it had it been done and popularized. It had been done, but not, but not on the level. He had, not at the level he had done. Right, and it and, and he had that thing. A lot of it here, sir. Go ahead. He had that thing of being undeniable too, kind of like what Jordan was in basketball. That's sort of like what he was on the guitar. You know, not everybody not everybody acknowledged guys like Stevie Ray or Wes Montgomery or even Hendrix. Really, you know, I know jazz guys that don't really acknowledge Hendrix as being a great guitar player, but Eddie was just undeniable, dude. There's no way around it. And he did other innovations. I mean, the brown sound, you know, he had some... Uh, Playing he, with tubes. Well, he uh, is my understanding, and you probably know better than I do, but he, my understanding, he had a voltage uh, variometer. What do you call it? Vari that you adjust the voltage and he would... Voltometer. Voltometer. He would lower the voltage instead of 120 coming out of the... He, he would put a box between the outlet and his amp to make the voltage lower. Uh, and, and it was called a brown sound is uh, what my... I remember reading articles about it. Uh, have, it's been some time since I read them. To get but, the most out of the amp. Right. To get the, the lower the voltage levels. I mean, you know, most... You know, pedals, I mean, you, a lot of pedals that uh, before you had plug-in electronics, uh, guitar players would take batteries or were reduced, that were about to die, and use those to to power their distortion pedals because it gave a different kind of a sound. And uh, now you can adjust your you can adjust your voltage to give that sound so that it's, you don't have to rely on batteries that are about ready to die and hope they don't die in the middle of the gig. Yeah, to exactly. get that sound. You can get it constant all the time just by lowering the voltage. So, you know, that's not a new trick either. But, you know, innovation is really, for the most part, taking something that has been done and reapplying it in a new way. That's really what innovation is. Yeah, or taking two ingredients that everybody's already used and putting them together that way for the first time, you know. Yeah, so that's innovation. You know, something that is absolutely brand new. Yeah. With no precedent. Very few, very few things in any field. Sure. What you think? Absolutely. There's always a precedent. There's always a shoulders that's, that you're standing on. Somebody's shoulders that you're standing on. I mean, that's like uh, cooking a good soup, man. I mean, we're all basically working with the same ingredients and yeah. every once in a blue moon, somebody will put two of them or three of them together and go, oh, wow. And usually when people are really brilliant innovators. Once they do it, it's painfully obvious that it's like, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, why did I think of that? How many times? Right. I mean, product, new product sure. introductions, or could be anything. Well, why didn't I think of that? Because yeah, yeah, it is so obvious. I'm like, absolutely, yeah. Because it's so simple. I remember when loopers, when loopers first hit, and a lot of the musicians I knew were like, "Oh, that's like cheating," you know. There was this big negative energy around it, and I was going, "Why haven't we had this for forty years?" Uh, it's like, yeah. makes perfect sense. Of course, man, I play it and it just records it and plays it back. 
And I think loopers have really changed the game, man, especially the live game. Yeah, Ed Sheeran, man. Ed Sheeran, you know, one of the A-list superstars uh, in the in the world right now as an as an artist. He he goes on tour. He played Nissan Stadium in Nashville, the stadium the stadium tour. What's that? Hundred thousand people would typically mm -hmm. be in a stadium because you can fill up. The, I mean, most stadiums hold like sixty thousand in the stands, but when you do a music deal, you have people on the on the field. And so I think a typical stadium, well, what would be 100,000 people probably? Anyway, so he's playing to roughly 100,000 people, and it's he's the only one on stage for the entire two hours or whatever he played. Just him and a couple of loopers. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's something doing, else. Doing all the per percussion parts on his acoustic guitar. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and then looping them around uh, and keeping people. And by all accounts, it was a great show. Now, I didn't go to that show. I had tickets to it. But I went to a, out of town to a venue, which I regret, and I gave those tickets away. But I heard it was a great show. <laughs> if I had to do it all over again, I would have gone to the show and skipped the songwriting thing in Colorado. But what are you going to do? Hey, man. He'll come back around. He'll come back around, yeah. He's a young guy. He'll be back. He'll be back. I always prioritize concerts, the must-sees, by how old they are. I that's why I saw, that's why I saw the Rolling Stones. I'm the same uh, way, man. Two years ago, I mean, like, how much longer can they tour? Right. But it was an incredible show, Mick. I mean, I'd never seen him before, but I couldn't imagine Mick ever being better. I'm right honest. after the heart attack, too, man. Right. And right after the heart attack, I showed you some of the videos. I mean, he was dancing, he was singing, he was doing it all, engaging. And I, I, like I said, I couldn't imagine him ever being better. I mean, it was just off the charts. Now, Keith, <laughs> Keith looked like he didn't know where he was. I showed you some of the things. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think he was playing, man. Right. He wasn't coming through the mains, we determined. We, we don't think he was. Uh, so must be a well-kept secret because I Googled for articles about that, that Keith is failing, but nobody says a word. They're keeping it tight, you know. He's failing. So well, you can't do it in the sound. It was like the Kung Fu movies, man. <laughs> it wasn't coming out the way it was looking, you know. Now, the the intro to Satisfaction, he played that poorly. Yeah. Uh, he was the only one playing when that came and he was playing it, but he didn't he, he didn't play it perfectly. He didn't play it right. I mean, it's not a, it's a pretty easy lick. I mean. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, that, that's it's not a very difficult lick. You could teach that to any of your beginner guitar students, right? Sure. Oh, so, uh, back when you had one on one guitar students. How long has it been since you've had one on one in person guitar students? Right before COVID. What? Oh, really? I didn't realize you were still doing that. On and off, man. You know, I had a few that, like, were really getting it and would call me randomly and say, hey, you know, I have some questions. Can I get with you? And I always felt like a little bit of obligation to them. Because you'd taught them before. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't want to, like, leave them hanging. So I, I had a couple of students, four or five this year, private students. I and, you know, I could see it. It's it's all in their level of interest, I think, man. The, the more into it they are, the more likely I'd be to do it. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, would, I, would, really like, I would really like to be able to call out my sax instructor and ask him some, some pointers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I Googled him. He moved away. He moved to Oklahoma. And I sometimes Googled him just to see what he was up to. And I Googled him a couple months ago and it just blew me uh, for a loop because the man's freaking in prison for being a pedophile. I didn't see that coming. Seven year, seven year uh, 
deal and then five years probation oh. after and if he survives it i mean i did not see that coming he did not strike me i mean he he's a, unbelievable uh, man i kept talking to you about that because it just shocked me remember how it was impacted me because this was this you know instructor figure and to see that he he was texting what he thought was a 14 year old girl that's what's and, so crazy man that's you know you can't look at somebody and know that they're a sicko you know, it's, it, it's scary. PTSD, you know, uh, you know, um, PH, you know, not a dumb guy. Uh, I guess we all have black spots or uh, dark, blind spots, not black spots, blind spots, right? Well, we they've had a thing here in town where they've arrested a bunch of people like that. Of Well, I see them now on... Um, on TikTok, there's this group that are not connected to law enforcement, but they do turn over all their videos and they post these videos on TikTok. And they are literally, I don't know where you put it out as bait. It must be sites where you where you advertise and pretend to be a 14 year old. And then they videotape going to meet the guy when the guy thinks he's meeting a 14 year old girl or 14 year old boy. I don't know why 14 is the year they choose is the age they choose. I guess it's it's the old enough, but not too too old. Uh, it's just interesting that they, when they're right. doing this, uh, uh, this um, these project, what is it called? When you do a sting, a sting operation, they use the age of fourteen. They must be. They must have researched and found out. Well, the one they did in Oklahoma, they said it was very highly developed. The techniques and the words that they use, the phrases that they use, because they wanted to make sure that it was all admissible in court. So they were very, very careful and methodical in the way they handled it. And I mean, he never did, he never met anyone. It was just his intent. It convicted him for seven years. And, you know, cause there never was a 14 year old girl. And now they're, they're, they're posting. There was one I just saw the other day on TikTok of these people that go out and there was this guy who had been a politician in Massachusetts, state politician, and he wasn't any longer. And he was going to try to meet a 14 year old boy. And he was like, and they went videotape when they went to see him. And as soon as he figured out who they were, he tried to walk away and they're chasing him saying, why did you want to meet a 14 year old boy? Do you know, this is, you know, shaming him and then turn it over to the police. And I guess that gets arrested. He, he yeah. got arrested. So, you know, it's a, the stings are going on now and that's, that's good, good, man. Cause you know, this pedophile stuff is a cancer that someone who's abused as a child will tend often has a high probability to abuse as an adult because what's done to you, you do back. I mean, that is human nature. Yeah. And uh, if you're abused as a child, you probably will be abuser, whatever kind of abuser that is. If your dad abused your mom, you probably will more have a higher likelihood to abuse any women in your life as a, as right. a, as a boy, as a man. So, uh, yeah, getting it rooted out and not just turning the other cheek uh is very important i feel so kudos that they're doing the lord's work those people that are doing absolutely that. man so, it's gotta stop somewhere yeah so it's evil thing and then uh yeah i wonder i mean because he's uh dr dr spaith I, I wonder i just uh he's a very nerdy guy very you know because you could think somebody got a phd in music you have to be really di dig deep into the nerdy intricacies of uh, uh music he told me that for he had to take a test and they now his thesis if you will was to do a recital you know you don't want to screw up and hit a bad note on your recital for your phd but before that he had to take tests and one of the tests was on the history of music and they could ask them anything since music began about any genre any question about history of music I mean, how do you study for that? That's a lifetime worth of knowledge, man. But in spite of having to study for that, he still thought that Eric Clapton was just an acoustic uh, singer-songwriter. <laughs> he just knew him from, you know, the unplugged uh, Tears from Heaven. Tears, t yeah, Tears from Heaven uh song he didn't know that he had been a guitar god clapped in his god i mean so he missed that part of music history that's crazy man 
Because I remember talking to him because Clapton's my number one influence. And I was, remember one time we were, I was relating it to sax, you know, because trying to learn the sax is very much a beginner. And I would, you know, he would say, this is the way you do that. And then I remember one time I said, well, you know, you know, I was taught, and I think most guitar players will teach that you should use all four of your fretting fingers, right? When you teach your students, use mm -hmm. your pinky, develop the strength of your pinky. Absolutely. Because if you don't, you're you're really you're only at seventy five percent. I mean, there's four fingers. Well, your thumb as well can go over the top, but four fingers. If you talk about the fingers, if you say you're not going to use this one, you know, your this one is the weakest one, of course, but you have to build it up, right? Well, Clapton, if you ever watch him play, and I have watched him a lot, he rarely uses his pinky. Yeah, he slides up that third finger if he's going to that that fret, that third fret up or fourth fret up, I guess it would be. He slides up, and that's not really efficient. But he wasn't; he was self-taught, so he didn't do that correctly. And so I once alluded something to do with a sax technique that Dr. Spade was trying to teach me, and I alluded to, to Clapton. Well, Clapton's you know one of the greatest guitar players, three-time inductee into the Hall of Fame, all that, and he didn't play it properly. And he comes back to me and he said, "Well, that really doesn't matter, right? Because he's just an uh, acoustic uh, singer-songwriter, right?" I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he did a weird thing. He does a weird thing where he bends with one finger too. Yes, he does. Yes, he, doesn't he does. Reinforce his bends. He'll just bend. No, he does. Just as just as ring finger, like just push up with one. And his first finger. He'll he'll also bend with his first finger. Just just that. strange. Yeah. Uh, it's like the most inefficient way to do it, but he uses really light strings and makes it work. So. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Everybody's he's, got their own little quirks, man. He's the only three-time inductee. I mean, he's the only three-time inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. No one he else. belongs there three times. You know, so, you know, I'm a little biased because he's my number one influence. But, uh, yeah. I, when I was younger, I almost got in a fight because uh, uh, I was meeting some friends at a, at a bar. And... Uh, the one guy was talking about Clapton. Oh, we were, I was going to a concert, or I had been to at a concert, Clapton concert. And one of the guys said, uh, Clapton, he just stands there like he has a stick up his butt. Because Clapton is not, he doesn't dance around the stage. He does stand in one spot. And my roommate looks at me and goes, oh, oh. Because <laughs> he knew how much of a fan I was. And I took offense to that. And we had a bit of a heated argument. That he didn't really care. It was just a casual so comment. Good man, he can do that. Yeah. <laughs> he I thought that was a. How dare you criticize my hero? <laughs> right. Well, people listen with listen with their eyes. That's the trouble. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, everybody has an opinion, and opinions yeah. are. You know, your opinion, eat my opinion. We're, you know, we're allowed to have our opinion, right? Well, we got some more time here. We got, we're at 38 minutes. We got some more time. You want to launch into any new subject that you have burning in your heart? Uh, not really, man. I mean, down with the Lakers. That's all I got to say. You're down Go with heat. the Lakers. Go Heat, yes. Down yeah. with the Lakers. Yeah, I mean, as a Celtics fan, um, well, I was talking to my nephew, Seth, as we were watching the closing minutes of the game last night, which was game four of the Lakers Heat finals. And it was close with less than a minute to go. I think the Lakers were up six and they had the ball. And, uh, and uh, Anthony Davis hit a three with less than a minute to go. So now they're up nine. The only way that the Heat could have won is if they had stopped him and gone back and gotten a couple threes to tie the game maybe. And I remember telling Seth, I said, well, now it's over. And now the Lakers are going to win. Because 3-1, they're up 3-1. If they had lost that game and it was up, it was 2-2, he would have a chance. But you're not going to, you're not going to win four, uh, you're not going to win three consecutive games against the Lakers. Right. What do you Well, I believe 
that Anthony Davis has an incredibly unfair advantage as a shooter because all that he has to do is face the goal and focus his eyes to the middle of his brow <laughs> and aim the ball at that. The, dude the uniform! He, he basically has a sight. And once he dials it in, you can't stop him, man. I used to see it at Kentucky all the time. You can't stop that dude. Once he starts staring at the middle of the eyebrow, <laughs> it's all over forever. You know, the, the, the thing that burns my saddle, burns my butt, burr under my saddle, what, what, what am I trying to say, is that Tyler Hero, the rookie, the 20-year-old rookie for the Heat, the kid has been lighting it up. He's only 20 years old. And uh, they showed a thing last night. The number of 10 point, the games where he short scored at least 10 points as a rookie is the, I think only, there's only one other player. I can't remember who it was. Somebody from back in the day, 19. And he's been off the charts. He, in one of the games we lost, he was against the Heat. The Celtics lost. He had 37 points as a rookie. And here's the thing, the Celtics and the Heat for the last lot for the for the draft had the same record. And, and they're all the tiebreakers didn't break the tie. They have all these tiebreakers record against each other and, and all these different things. But if you get to the end of the three or four tiebreakers, you have the same record and all these other tiebreakers don't break the tie. They use a very novel and sophisticated method of breaking that tide. You know what that is? They do a coin flip. So they literally did a coin flip and the Heat won that coin flip. And they, so then they picked 13th and the Celtics picked 14th. Now the Celtics was hot on Hero, Tyler Hero, the guy we were just talking about. The Celtics were hot on him. Celtics want, probably would have taken Hero if, they, if he'd been available. But Pat Riley, who has a, who's the general manager, legend in the NBA. He was a coach, won, won, won many times uh, as, a, as a coach. And he hates the Celtics, and he knew the Celtics were interested in Hero. So partially, because he also probably thought he was a good player, he took him so that for the next pick, Hero was not available. And so I'm sitting there thinking, man, only for the fate of a coin flip, Hero could have been a Celtic. <laughs> would, have been a, would have been a nice addition, right? Oh, man. We probably would have beat the Heat. I will say that if we had had Hero, we would have beat the Heat, and it'd be the Celtics versus the, the Lakers. But they would have you know, matched up better with the Lakers, man. The I Heat, think so. The I Heat think so. Overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I really do. I think there'd be a chance uh, to beat them. Um, but you know, alternative universes is the cat dead or alive in the box? <laughs> right, because there's an infinite number of those. So in some alternative universe, that coin flip goes another way. And Tyler Hero is a Celtic, and uh, we beat the Lakers in the finals, and we get banner number eighteen, and the so uh, the Lakers are still at six. Uh, no, yeah, eighteen, and the Lakers are still at sixteen. But in this universe that we are currently in, the Lakers are going to tie the Celtics for most championships, and it hurts me to say that. I have pain right now. I have pain. Yeah. I don't like to see LeBron get another one. Well, uh, respect for LeBron because, you know, when they won, when he was with the Cavaliers and they won against the, 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 the dynasty, the, the, the death star of the Golden State, which was what they were back then. Um, he, there's five categories, as you know. There's points. There's... Uh, assists, there's rebounds, there's blocks, and there's steals. Those are five categories. For those seven games, I think it was a seven-game series, wasn't it? For those seven games, he led all players in those five categories. 
I don't think that has ever been done before. That's amazing. It probably will never be done again. I mean, these are positions, you know, assist is usually the point guard. Yeah. You know, rebound is usually one of the big guys. Steals, blocks. Blocks is usually one of the big guys. You, you know, it's it's he's 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 a freak of nature. That that right there to me earned my earned my respect for for him. And I don't like him personally. I don't I like him either. I respect him, but I don't like him. I think he's whiny. I mean, just look at some of his facial expressions on the floor. <laughs> Walking off the court. Walking off the court. Well, you know, my nephew asked me about that, and I got to say, you know, other teams have done that. Celtics did that when they got beat in the finals back in the Larry Bird era. Uh, the Pistons did it when they got beat. Um, it's been done before now, but it's usually done on the last game when you're knocked out. It's usually not done in a game when you still got more games to play. Right. That would probably only knock against him. I mean, you still got, you're still ahead. You're still up. Why are you so, why are you so pissy about it? Yeah. He's mad to be losing it all. <laughs> well, you gotta, I mean, his, his competitiveness. I mean, was it game two? I remember watching game two and the look in his face, it was like, he, he was so locked in and so fierce. I was like, man, this guy would kill right now if he had. To. It'll be, he'll have an argument. You know, they win this year, and if, if he gets maybe another one before he retires, the argument can be made, you know, that he's up there with Jordan. It'll be arguable. Yeah, he's 35 now, and he's got – what has he got? Has he got three? Or has yeah. he got four? He's got three. Well, he's, he's not going to get to Jordan's level of six. No. That won't. Ha I don't think that'll happen. He'll be 38 if he wins every one of them. Um, uh, possible. I mean, right now with uh, who knows what they're doing, gene therapy, who knows? I mean, age is not what it was once was. You know, there's yeah. advanced techniques. I mean, look, Tom Brady. How's Tom Brady doing? Great. He's doing great. We talk a different sport, but. You know, I mean, he, he's the, the rules of aging ha, are being shifted, right? You know, sure. LeBron sure has all, I mean, he's, he can afford all the trainer, all the experimental technology that none of us even have a clue what they're doing. Uh, and in another field, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise is 55 and he looks like he's 25. Yeah. So what technology is he using? I mean, so, so when you're at that level, you have, you have things available to you that are not available to us normal peons. You know? Sure. Oh, um, and he seems to take care of his body. I mean, uh, LeBron has never been injured. He's never, he rarely loses a game. I mean, he's probably got to be the mo one of those iron men of all uh, NBA players, right? I hardly ever remember him missing a game. No, he's, he's always, he's always on it. You know, so, uh, all right, well, we have passed our 45 minutes. I'm allowed to finish now under the yes. rules of engagement for Jimmy D and the Wolves. <laughs> well, it's good to see you, buddy. Absolutely. Jimmy D Thanks and the Wolves. Peace. See you next time. <laughs>